Okay, hello and welcome everybody back to Divorce Stories, the podcast, and I'm your host, divorce attorney, Dennis Vetrano. We have a really special treat for you today. Special guest, Rhonda Njordic. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Yes. Okay, <laughs> excellent. CEO and founder of Women's Financial Wellness Center and host of Divorce Conversations for Women for Women's Podcast. You're an accomplished speaker international author has been interviewed on several national and local platforms as a financial expert. Wow, that's a lot of qualifications. I am so excited to have you here. I can't tell you. Awesome. I am happy to be here. So thanks for the invitation. Yeah. Okay. So so let's jump right into it. Um, you know, uh, attorneys help clients navigate through the legal aspect of divorces, right? And social workers and psychologists help uh, people go through the emotional aspects of it. So in your profession, what is it specifically that you assist clients going through a divorce process? Yeah, that's a great question, right? And I always say there's three aspects. There's the legal, financial, and emotional. And so, of course, right, that financial aspect is, hey, yeah, we've got an attorney. What exactly are you doing? Right. And so essentially what we're doing is we're helping women navigate through the divorce process with all the things related to the finances. So okay. we have a signature process that we take our clients through, but it starts with making sure they've got the right attorney. It makes We make sure that they have a budget, which I always tell people like, hey, it's not sexy or glamorous, but it's such a foundational piece to be able to answer all of their questions related to the finance. Can I keep the house? How much can I afford for health insurance? What is this? You know, all the things. Right. So um, and we're a sounding board. We're a sounding board for them. Hey, Rhonda, what do you think about this? I don't know. Well, let's pull out the numbers. Let's run some calculations. Let's look at some different options. So we're always looking at helping position women to make good decisions, not only do the during the divorce process, but after. So if we can flex those muscles to say, okay, here's the decision. What are the pros and cons of this? What do you want to do? Like yesterday, I had a meeting with a woman and she was presented with a proposal and she's like, Rhonda, I don't even know. And I said, okay, well, let's just take a step back do you want cash? And she's like, I don't know. And I said, okay, well, because right now the way that it's structured, right? All of your equity is in your home. Right. Are you going to sleep at night knowing that you don't have hardly any money in retirement? You don't have hardly any money in the bank, but you have your home that doesn't have a mortgage on it. She goes, that's a good question. Right. So we kind of talked through that. And she said, not having a mortgage on my home is very important to me. Okay. So that becomes top priority. And then I say, okay, well, let's rank the other two. Is it retirement trump cash or cash trump retirement. Right. And she said cash because she said, Rhonda, if my house needs something, you know, or if I, I need access to something and I'm not retirement age, that's going to trump that. So now we can order those priorities for her. And then when we're looking at dividing property, I can say, okay, well, be, we need to make sure that how these things are divided, right? How the assets are divided gives her access to cash, whether that's bank accounts, like direct cash, or whether it's for taking retirement funds and saying, well, if we quadro your husband's 401k, you could have access to cash, not ideal, but right. you could have access to cash without a penalty, at least, even though you have to pay taxes on it. And those are the kinds of strategies that are really customized, I think. And each situation is different. I mean, some pers- some people might say, well, how could you say you know, that she shouldn't you know, take half the retirement? Because it's not right now important to her. And I, you know, I need to work within what's important to her um, because she's going to sleep better when we do that. Right. And the centerpiece, the beginning of that is is setting up a budget, right? Yeah. And, you know, it's funny because um, I I think a lot of people going through the divorce process don't realize how much we utilize a phrase called netting. We use that all the time. And that's and that's really trading off one asset for the next. But do you find that um, you're working with clients to to analyze the difference between present value money and future value money, i.e. difference between, say, house equity and retirement plans? Yeah, absolutely. You know, and I think, again, there those are definitely important conversations, right? Because we're looking at the current. We are looking at projected. But again, I have to be able to say, you know, I'm no longer in that role of being a traditional financial planner. I'm not doing financial advising. I'm not selling products. I'm not doing any of that. I'm taking a step back and saying, okay, yes, I can give her all of the information and she's going to have to make empowered decisions. And I believe that when women have information, when they have the data, right? They're right. going to make the decision that's best for them. Not what's best for Rhonda, not what's best for Dennis, right? 
But right. I think a lot of times they don't even know, like they're, nobody's walking them through the different options and talking through, you know, the strategies around that. And so they're being forced to make decisions or asked to make decisions without actually having done the exercise of determining what's important to them. Right. And you know, it's so funny. I love the use of the word empowered, especially when it's associated with finances, because usually when you hear empowered, it's associated with so many other things, but not the finances, but it should be more often for sure. So I have a question for you. What made you want to start the Women's Financial Wellness Center? What was the motivation? That's such a good question. So I had been in the financial industry for 12 years. So I was one of very few women in a very male dominated industry. And I started very early on wanting to help women. We would do, you know, workshops and events, standing room only. I did a lot of speaking and um, I loved it. And then about 12 years in, I had the opportunity to say, what do I want my business to look like five years from now? And when I looked at five years out, it was more of the same, more assets, more clients, more revenue, but the same. Right. And I had a lot of women that were coming through my doors like, Ron, I'm thinking about divorce. I'm so, or I'm in the midst of it. I'm so overwhelmed. Nobody's helping me. My attorney's not calling me back. I'm being asked to make financial decisions. I've never handled the finances. Right. So there were a couple things that happened. One was I had the opportunity to go through a business incubator for women business owners. And the guy that was heading it up used to be um, a consultant for Zappos, Arizona State University. And he basically was like, Rhonda, your vision is more than you being in the industry. And I was like, oh my yeah. gosh, don't even talk to me. Like, I've worked so hard for these licenses. I've built a great thing here. And he was like, if you really want to chase what you've told me that you want, it's going to require you to go a different direction. And you can leverage all the experience and all the knowledge, but it's going to be different. So I started researching and there wasn't anything in the marketplace like what I wanted. I wanted a creative space for women that was independent of financial product sales that would help them navigate through, coach them, meaning like, hey, we're, we're helping them think through the mindset, educate, providing actual like information, right? But guidance along the way, not, hey, educate and have, hey, have fun with that. It's, We're walking them through that. And then the analytical part of crunching the numbers and really being able to back what we're saying with the data. So we launched Women's Financial Wellness Center in uh, 2014. And the first year we had over 300 women that came through our doors. And everybody was like, Rhonda, where were you 10 years ago? Where were you 20 years ago? And I was like, "Um, college, how about that? (laughs) (laughs) But you knew you made the right decision. I made the right decision. And nobody, and within three months of me launching, I was able to really tap into uh, my, my, um, bachelor's degree is in communications. And I always thought I would be a news reporter or in public relations. And so now I had the opportunity to do the things that I loved, which was pitch the media on us opening the company. We had you know, radio interviews, TV interviews. And so we've just continued to go down that path. And then in 2018, I launched, um, divorce conversations for women podcast. And I have the privilege of interviewing amazing people like you and a host of others, right. Yeah. And I get to have you guys share your stories with me um, and, you know, facilitate those great conversations and challenge the status quo and all the things. And it's been absolutely fantastic. And so what that did was it allowed us to go outside of where our headquarters is, which is Wisconsin. And now we're working with clients all over the country. And it's just been absolutely fantastic. And we now have obviously been in business as, um, as of October for seven years. And at the five-year mark, I was like, okay, this is why I left because this is exactly what I'm doing. And so we've just continued to grow um, and continue to reach as many women as we possibly can with a message of hope and empowerment um, and helping, you know, ultimately the goal, Dennis, is for us to change the stats, you know, for women to come out of the divorce process, not being a statistic that, you know, 41% of their lifestyle is going to drop because they have been you know, not working and their spouse, ex-spouse continues to have, you know, opportunities for career advancement and things like that. And the women are really stagnant. And I think a lot of that's because they don't know what questions to be asking and they're overwhelmed and they don't know what the journey is. And I always say like, you know, we know what the journey is generally speaking, but there's always going to be things that are like, oh, that's interesting. I didn't see that coming. Right. Yep. And I always say, well, you, me, right, their team, we're walking down a dark path. We've got the flashlight. As long as we can see, right, enough to keep moving, we're good, right? Right. And and we're going to help. Oh, I think we need to change, you know, directions a little bit. We need to pivot or whatever. And it's just been absolutely so rewarding. And now we have... um, 
hired additional women to work and be the face of, you know, client facing um, other women that have been in the financial industry that are also passionate about it and just want to be that consultant for women that are going through divorce. Oh, my God. I love that. And, and you do. I mean, you have to appreciate that your story, even just your story for the women you work with, that blueprint, that's an inspiration. And, yeah. and it doesn't matter. I, I find that I, I look at divorce many times as a transition in your life, right? It's a turn of a page, a major turn, more major for some than others. But, totally. but to realize you can look ahead and you can decide what you want your path to be and go after it and get it. And to see how well you've done doing that is such an inspiration. That's so awesome. I'm so excited about that. Yeah, right. thank you. Thank you. It's it's just been absolutely amazing. And, you know, and I think, again, you know, when we first started the company, it had a, it had a different feel. It was just me, right? right? I left my firm. I had a business plan and a big vision. And this small town girl was marching to my new office, right? And I was like, I'm right. going to change the world. Like, that's just what's going to happen. Right. And now, right, now it's... um it's taken on more of like an advocacy where we're seeing things behind the scenes that are really disturbing. Right. We're, you know, having to call people on their stuff because it's like, no, this is not accurate or correct or whatever. And it's, and I think part of that too is, you know, finding the right attorneys from the beginning. And I think you and I resonated right away because I did feel like we had the same mindset. We had the same vision or similar vision. We right. were committed to helping people make good decisions. And that's not always the case. Um, and so I think that's an important part of, you know, of the process is making sure that you really truly have the team and that you're worthy of having the best team that you can have. And in fact, it's not probably going to cost you more. It's going to save you time and money and energy and headache and frustration and all the things when you've got right. the right people. Right, right. So, so knowing how difficult these situations are, and, I, and my listeners out there, I'm sure, are, are going through this, the vast majority of them either been through it or about to go into it. What would be one thing you would want to tell somebody who's about to embark in the divorce process, um, especially for those people who are what we call the non-moneyed spouses out there? And it's, a, you know, it's, it's stressful to think, oh, my God, I'm going to have to manage these finances. Yeah, I would say, you know what, you're smart. You can do it. Um, you know, you're not going to probably do it overnight, but you can do it. And, you know, it's, it's one of those things where sometimes we just have to take the little steps. Right. And I love seeing the aha, like, oh my gosh, Rhonda, like that totally makes sense to me. Right. And so there's, it's, it's, it's a foundational kind of stacking, right. It's the steps of, you know, being able to acquire some basic terminology, like, you know, what is, what does it mean that I have a 401k? What does it mean that those funds are going to be quadroed? Right. What does it mean that I have insurance? And so we use like those micro moments to share like, okay, do you understand what you have? And because all of us have come from the financial industry, you know, we can share with them like, okay, this is what you have. Let me, let me just take 30 seconds, right? And share with right. you what this means. And they're super grateful. So then when they hear it again, they're like, oh, I've heard that, right? So it's, I think the formula for confidence is knowledge plus experience equals confidence. And that's what I would want women to know, listeners to know. And that is, you know what? You can do it, Um, you know, but it's going to be a process. Right. You know, it's funny in in these cases as divorce lawyers, you know, the typical uh, approach is, okay. you get your client what they're entitled to. They get their proverbial half. And you know what? I I wish there was more follow through. We we typically don't have and can't have that continued follow through. I mean, clients don't want to pay us hourly (laughs) to do to, 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 you know, participate in the case of the follow through to see you know, look, okay, you get your half, but what now? Is there a piece of that 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 um, that you do in terms of the follow through with clients to make sure that they're reaching their financial um, goals, not just as a divorce process, but post divorce? Yeah. So um, once people get through the process, right, and there's a lot of conversations that we can be having through the process to make sure that when they get toward the end and there's that final document that's being put together, that we've thought about all the things we've thought about life insurance and what that looks like. We've thought right. about health insurance. We've thought about re- the retirement, like all the pieces, not right. to mention the kids stuff and the variable expenses. But I have found that the details, the more details that we can have included in those documents um, is really important. And we will often review those. So the attorneys obviously put those together. And then I'll say, hey, you know what, when you get that from the attorney, 
I want to take a look at it. And I'm looking at it from the lens of the financials, right? I'm not the legal right. expert, but I'm like, hey, you know what? Can we get a little more clarity on this? Can we put some timelines around when this needs to happen? I think this is going to provide some more clarity post-divorce, right? right. And once the divorce is over, we do a post-divorce strategy session, which is we go through the final document, we map out all the timelines, and we make sure that they are in a position where they can move forward with the right team that's we're passing the baton to. So that baton passing usually goes to an estate planning attorney to make sure they can get all their stuff in order. And then the financial stuff. And we have a team of vetted financial advisors that we work with. And I will say it's very hard to find ones that aren't just there to sell products. Right. Um, in fact, I was going to have somebody on my, I had a, did a podcast interview yesterday with somebody's in the industry and I'm not publishing it because I don't, I don't like their attitude. <laughs> right. Right. Uh, so I'm like, I'm like the, you know, I am so adamant about making sure we have the right people. That's heart. Their hearts are in the right place. They're not there to just make a buck and sell stuff like forget it. And so, so that post piece is really important because we then, I can tr- and trust that they're going to be moving forward with their goals. I provide a summary for that, that, you know, baton handoff right. to say, Hey, here are the goals. Here's where things are landing. Here's what's important to them. That team then works together. So the estate planner and the financial planners work together to make sure that all those pieces are, are in the right place. And then at that point I do move on. Um, however, we do have a lot of women that have said, Rhonda, I love what you're doing. I want to be involved. How can I be an ambassador? So I actually received an email um, on Friday before I was heading out of town for a business retreat from somebody that I worked with four years ago. And she said, Rhonda, I got your newsletter. I love seeing the growth within your company. I thought because it's, you know, Thanksgiving month, this was a good time for me to reach out to you and say, thank you. I just sold my house. Um, I'm 65 years old. I'm approaching retirement. Um, but the confidence that you gave me four years ago has helped me to make some of these decisions that I've made recently. And so we do hear from, you know, women that have utilized our services and, and benefited from the work that we're doing. Oh my God, that's so awesome. And I think, you know, look, there's a few things to take away from that, from what you just said. I mean, look, you don't do everybody else's thing. You don't try to. And that's always been my philosophy. I'm your lawyer. I'm not your therapist. I'm not your counselor. I don't do real estate stuff. I don't do corporate <laughs> stuff. I don't. I'm your divorce lawyer. That's what I do. And I don't want to be those other things. Mm-hmm. No matter mm-hmm. how much money you tell me you're going to pay me. Well, can you? T- no, I don't want to do that. I do what I'm good at. Yep. You know, and I leave the other pieces to the experts in that particular area. And I love the concept of it's a relay. It's a relay race passing the baton. Mm hmm. You know, and now now keep in mind in any lawyer's um, final settlement document, it says, well, you should have, con- you know, consulted with a financial expert. I'm not a financial expert. I can't guarantee what's in. There is a reason why that's there, folks. There is a reason why that's mm-hmm. there. It's basically saying, yes, you should have somebody assisting you with your financial plan throughout this mm-hmm. process. Mm-hmm. So, Wow. Okay, excellent. So uh, three three tips that you could give my listeners about the divorce process. Ooh, all right, let me think. Um, so I would say the first one is um, get out of your own way. And I know that sounds kind of interesting, like Rhonda, you're talking about the money, but I think a lot of times women get in their own way. They either don't think that they're worthy to invest in the knowledge or whatever around the finances, they bring guilt or shame to it. Like I should have been more involved. I mean, I was sitting in a mediation um, last week and there were some things that transpired during the mediation that the wife didn't know. Husband had $367,000 of student loan debt that she was not aware of. He had a judgment again. I mean, there was all these things that came out that was right. heavy for her, right. right? And so she had to, in that moment, process and be willing to kind of get out of her own way you know, and we advocated and her, her final result was something I've never seen before, which was so awesome. Um, but I think it's easy for us to carry that around. So that would be the first thing. Okay. Um, the second thing would be, um, and again, not directly related to finances, but it's so important. And that is, you know, the self-care piece because the divorce process is a 
marathon. And yes. I think as we see that women go through this, right, they get toward the end and they're like, fine, I'll just do whatever and I'll agree to whatever. Um, and it really can be the detriment because, again, they're living with the consequences of what they agree to years and sometimes decades after. Right. So making sure that you just show up to the meetings um, with a clear headspace, with having the right questions to be asking, leaning into the conversations. If you don't feel like you're being respected, either push back or find different people. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> or both. <laughs> right. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, I mean, you need women need to be able to have their voice in these situations and be able to ask questions without being patronized, without being bullied into decisions. Um, and I think the last thing would be, um, gosh, there's just so many. I think that the other piece of it is not being afraid of asking for what you need. Um, you know, and again, they're all kind of interrelated, but I think that's a really, really important part of it. And once women can articulate what they need, their outcome is usually better. And that's where we can come in to kind of help them look at, like, let's get some clarity around what you need, right? right? Instead of saying, well, I'm just going to clip coupons forever and, you know, drive a beater car and be right. whatever. Like, no, that, that doesn't have to be what this looks like post-divorce, right? Um, you know, for you. So, Women are smart. They're really able to make great decisions, um, but you know it's a process. And um, and I think I guess maybe my bonus tip, Dennis, would be, you know, making sure that they're not just selecting the process because you know somebody tells them that they should. Like I feel like mediation has gotten a lot of steam over the, over the last few years. And what ends up happening, from my perspective, is that one spouse will say, let's do mediation yep. because they want it to remain neutral and they don't want the person to have an advocate or a voice so right. they can come in and steamroll, show right. all their spreadsheets, try to overwhelm. The people are like, I don't know what to be asking. Fine. It's sure. I guess it makes sense. Whatever. Right. And so I think you know, there's four different ways that people can get divorced. And I think we need to really make sure that we're taking a look at and being truly like brutally honest with ourselves is mediation, is litigation, is collaborative, you know, the best choice for me and why, and be able to say why, not because, oh, I want to play nice and I'm afraid and I want, I don't want to walk, I want to walk on eggshell, you know, don't want to walk on eggshells. That's not serving us because we're going to get steamrolled and we're going to be living with the consequences for way too long. I, I have to tell you, that is my experience to the letter as well. I'm a divorce mediator as well, but I will tell you there are so many situations that are just not right for divorce mediation. If there's a situation where there's a bully on one side or a That's narcissist right. on one side right. and, and a victim on the other side or somebody who simply acquiesces all the time, that is not your classic case for a successful divorce mediation. No. Will you divorce mediate? Sure, but you'll end up with an agreement that two years, five years, 10 years down the road, you're, you're kicking yourself in the rear. Yeah. Over it. yeah, it's not good. And I think, you know, and the other thing that people have to realize is there's, there's different like variations of mediation too, right? I mean, you, you could be in two separate rooms where the mediators popping back and forth. You could right. all be in the same room. You could have attorneys and then have the, you know, a third party mediator. There's a lot of different variations, right? but yeah, I think people just need to really, truly be eyes wide open. And if they're only doing mediation because they think it's going to save them money, you know, I don't know that that's the right message for that. You know, like right. you got to pick what what process is best for you. And in those sorts of circumstances, you save small dollars now, but you lose big things later. So so in the end, it ends up being a lot less cost effective than you thought it would be. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, it, it's funny in those processes. I, I think one of the most difficult things we wrangle with is exactly what you said, people being in the right headspace to really evaluate their situation midstream of divorce. Because we have so many clients who halfway through, they lose energy, they lose patience, and, and totally understandable because of the right. process. They throw their hands up and say, okay, whatever they want, whatever they want. So, so I always find it like super important to have a team at the outset. Yeah, not totally. not just not just friends, family support, not just counselor, but also financial expert, good lawyer yeah. who's going to advocate for you. That's right. Um, well, and I think, you know, there's there's 
any good negotiation, right? You're going to have the quid pro quo. I'm going to give you something in exchange for not. Right. I'm going to give you, give you, give you in exchange for nothing. That's not how this is supposed right. to work. Like you have to say, you know, yeah, I'll give right. you that because that's important. But in exchange, I want this. And we need to right. go into it with that mindset. And I think women as a whole, generally speaking, right? Again, because this is all that I work with all day long. Right. We're not good at negotiating. We don't know how to do it. We are afraid. Um but we've been able to help teach our clients, like, how do you lean into that? How do you have that conversation, whether it's the small stuff or the big stuff? And we've been able to be successful in doing that. And I think a right. lot of it, again, comes down to not doing the broad strokes, like, oh, well, this looks really great on paper. And, oh, it's going to be super simple. I mean, I think a lot of times people will come into these situations and say, well, you know, it, this is going to be simple. He's He said it's going to be simple. He's going to give me everything. You know, I'm going to be taken care of. We're going to split this, split this. I'm like, okay, time out right? Like, right. do we know what the house is worth? Do we know what the pension's worth? Do we know right. what? No, we don't, but we're just going to split all that stuff. And I'm like, here's the problem though. The problem with that is, especially for women, if we say, hey, I told him that I was going to give him the house. I told him he could have the pension. If we look then at the data, right? And it doesn't align with what we said, we now have this whole internal conflict and guilt and all the things because right. we want to be able to honor our word. So I always say, okay, Let's not make any, we can say, hey, here's what I'm thinking about. I'm thinking about doing this, but right. not actually saying we're going to do it until we have all the information. And so we can become a broken record that says, hey, I'm happy to make a swift decision when I have all of the information. I just need the data. Like when I have the financial disclosure statement or the financial affidavit and we have all the things, right? I'm happy to have a conversation. But until then, I'm not. Right. And that's always the first piece I've actually had in litigation cases. I've actually had a judge say something like, well, they just picked a value for the house or they're just going to use a Zillow valuation. And I'm here at the attorney's table losing my mind. And I'm saying to myself, hey, judge, mm -mm. if this was your sister or your kid or your friend, would you tell them to do that? Would you tell them that's a good idea that that the biggest asset the two of you own, you're just going to blindly guess what the value is and then have a buyout on that basis. It was <laughs> insane to me. This is this is a true story. I, I, I still can't even believe it's a true story. It's totally my hot button because it's like, what is going on? And same thing happened in the mediation. We, our client, we had to actually do the buyer's price opinion, right? A very right. detailed um, report that shows right. what the ho house could be sold for, all the issues, concerns, all that. Then over here, he does Zillow. Mediator says, well, We'll just take the numbers and divide them in half. And I said, absolutely. No, we're not. No, we're not. Right. He can go get a buyer, you know, buyer's price opinion and we can go head to head expert to expert. Fine. Right. right. Then if they're a little off, okay, fine. Let's split it in half. But not, we're not even talking apples to apples. No. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, the, and the swing might be like $50,000, $100,000, $200,000, which is insane to me that people are so flippant about it. People that are supposed to be entrusted with people's lives. Yeah. Well, and we could say the same thing about pension valuations, right? Should right. we even be having the conversation? I have had some situations where people have said, well, we'll just make sure that, you know, when, when it comes time to retire, the pension will be split. I'm like, oh, no. That's not how this is working. First of all, we want present value on our spreadsheet now. And secondly, right. it right. needs to be quadro. What does that mean? Qualified domestic relations order split. It means that it needs, she needs to have a portion of those retirement funds, the pension in her name, because right. if her ex-spouse passes away, otherwise she may not see right. anything. And right. who's going to, who are the divorce police that are going to come when, you know, 15, 20 years from now, when it's time to retire to say, oh, hey, did we split the pension? Did she get, yep, <laughs> yep. Yeah, because the pension companies don't care. They're not Absolutely. like, oh, I mean, we have, you know, they probably don't even know. Right. And here and here's the thing. People don't realize how important those quadros are, because I've had clients Huge. come to us either from other law firms or years later. And I say, hey, you know, and we always say, get your get your quadro done right away. Don't wait. You should be doing it contemporaneous or shortly after the Absolutely. resolution of the divorce case. And you'll have them come back to you four, five, eight, ten years later. It's like, do you know what risk you're taking? You could it's end terrible. up losing it, right? Terrible. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, it's the, it's those kinds of things, right? Like the post-divorce, what I call storm cleanup, which right. is so important because you're right. I mean, those quadros, and again, the, the attorneys are the ones who initiate those, correct? Right. Yep. Yeah. So, I mean, you guys are prepping all the stuff. You're getting it over 
to the company and then the people, I mean, it can take, you know, it can take eight, 12, 16 weeks to get those things done. Um, but it's so important. It is so important. Um, yeah. You know, yeah. so it's all those things that, again, the details, it's overwhelming. The, the whole process is overwhelming on all the things that people need to be thinking about and looking at and whatever. But that's why it's like, we just don't want them to be going through it alone because, you know, it's not only the process itself that's frustrating, but the impact again, that it's having, you know, right. not only on their lives, but potentially even generations. I mean, it's just really, really a big deal. Oh, good point. Good point. Generational for sure. And so, so I think you make a good point there. Don't go it alone. And, and I'll add one better. Don't think that just by having a lawyer, you're all set. You're all set. I've got Mm -hmm. one lawyer for my divorce. They're my counselor. They're my financial expert. No, they're not. (laughs) They are your divorce lawyer. And hopefully they are just a divorce specific lawyer. Right. Totally. And that's another great part, right? Is like I've had a couple of clients whose spouses have hired criminal law attorneys for their divorce. Oh, and it grief. is an absolute nightmare, nightmare. Good grief. Well, it's right. a buddy. It's a whatever. No, they don't know what they're doing. So they never respond to emails. Everything gets held up. It's like, no, you need somebody who is an expert right. in your field, not a generalist. Right. And somebody. And I think the other part too, Dennis, is I think sometimes people think, well, my husband's really difficult. They're really aggressive. And so I need somebody who's aggressive. Well, I think sometimes I always say what we really need is somebody who's humbly confident. We need somebody who's not going to get pushed around. Right. Wow. But humbly not confident. I like that. Can I use that? <laughs> you can. <laughs> I love that. Yes. Right. I mean, you don't want somebody who's going to go into these meetings and tick everybody off. It is not helping you. Right. Right. But you also need somebody who is can stay calm and is also not going to get pushed around. And that is where the the real empowerment, I think, comes from. Um, And again, it's selecting the right team. You know, we have clients ask us all. I I have clients ask us all the time. Are you aggressive? Are you good? Are you a bulldog? Are you going to go in there? And, And my response to that is always the same. We are not aggressive solely for the purpose of being aggressive. We are aggressive when we need to be. If, if, if I can get 90% of what you want by negotiating a fair negotiation, you both walk away with a fair resolution, that's the most successful case I could have. Yep. Driving up a legal bill just to send nasty letters back and forth, mm-mm, that's not me. No. That's not me. If I need to say something, I will. But for the most part, I, I try, to, try to put that to the side because it's wasteful. Yeah. Yeah. And and counterproductive. I think, well, right. And I think the other thing that we can do, too, is, again, I think – again, it's, it's as much of a science as an, is an art, right? Because there's this dance of kind of going back and forth. I think the key thing is, okay, when are you going to be proactive? What, what is at this point, right? If it's not done by this time, then this is what's going to happen. Like we always have to have a game plan, right? Like one of the clients we are working with, one of the attorneys who's actually happens to be here in Wisconsin, who's fabulous. She's so proactive. And so, you know, rather than waiting for stuff to hit the fan, we kind of saw the direction it was going. And she said, listen, I'm going to be proactive and get some stuff in place. And one of the ways that I think attorneys, in my opinion, can do that is temporary orders, like making sure that we just have, we don't have to wait till the mortgage isn't being paid and stuff's not getting done to just say, listen, let's just get on the same page. Let's put together kind of the ground rules for how this is going to work. Who's going to pay what, who's going to get the kids, what that's going to look like, who has occupancy of the house. Let's just get it in writing. Right. You know, and it's smoother rather than, again, I think a lot of times people want to avoid it and say, well, now he's now he's three months behind on the mortgage. It's impacting my credit. Oh, now we're going to do some of this stuff. So I think there's an aspect of being proactive. Yes. Right. And we can do it in a way that is going to be not perceived as being aggressive. It's all about how we, I think, approach it. Right. And, and, I, and I explain to clients orders, especially ones like those, they're floors. Yep. Even if you think that you're perfectly amicable, everything's working out, everything's fine. I, in, I encourage you, I insist, or not yep. suge- insist, I strongly suggest you get a floor. The terms of your order are a floor. Totally. Whatever you can agree to between the two of you outside of that order is your ceiling. So get your floor. You'd be surprised how high the ceiling gets when the floor is solid. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, so yeah, I think, again, it's, 
you, nobody wants to go into these situations saying, oh, well, it's just going to, you know, I want it to be super contentious and I want to be fighting. Right. You know, we everybody right. wants it to be amicable. Right. The only challenge with that particular word is it means not having conflict. And mm-hmm. I just don't know that that's reasonable, right? I mean, I, we have right. to have realistic expectations to say we're going to have some conflict, but how are we going to deal with the conflict? How right. are we going to navigate through that? How are we going to negotiate through that? And that's where I think you know, that's where people are going to start to start to feel a little bit lighter and more empowered through the process when is when they can do that. Yes. Okay. So last thing, what's your favorite quote you could share with our listeners? Uh, and, and, I, and I'm hopeful it's going to be super inspiring because I, yeah. I expect I expect that that level from you. Yeah. Um, so my favorite quote is actually a quote by Kristen Armstrong. And it was something that she shared as she was going through her divorce many, many years ago. And it, and it is when you find yourself in a vulnerable spot, The best thing that you can do is surround yourself with the strongest, finest, most positive people you can find. Wow. Wow. That was worth the wait. That was (laughs) worth the wait for that quote. Okay. Oh, my yeah. God. I'm, I'm, I'm so happy you uh, joined us today and shared all of your knowledge and expertise and experiences. So I need to ask you, what if clients want to work with you? What if yeah. some of my listeners say, hey, I need those sorts of services? How can they find you? What services can you offer? And is it only Wisconsin or is it other, in other states? Yeah, so we are happy. We are working all across the country. So no matter where your listeners are throughout the U.S., we can help them. Um, the best place for them to find us is um, our website, WFWC, so Women's Financial Wellness Center, WFWCDivorce.com. Um, there is our podcast so they can listen to some of those episodes to say, hey, do we really like what this gal has to say and what she's all about? Um, And that's where they'll find your episode once it goes live. Um, We have blog articles that, again, are pushing the status quo and just really helping women step out their comfort zones and do what they need to be doing. And the last thing is they can go to the contact tab um, and book a time. Uh, right in my calendar, 30 minute, we offer a free initial consult. I do all of those calls. um, So they'll be talking to me directly. I can answer any questions they have around the finances, get a good general understanding of their situation. And then if we get to the end of it, and they say, you know, hey, how can we work together, then we can certainly have that conversation. Excellent. And where do they find the podcast and the blogs? Because I know that my, my listeners and clients love going to our website and finding the blog posts. They're super helpful little tidbits of yes. information. So where can they find those two things? Yes. Yeah, so the blog is on our website, wfwcdivorce.com, okay. as is the podcast. However, the podcast is also on all of the channels um, where they would regularly listen to podcasts. So iTunes, iHeartRadio, Spotify, all the places. So okay. Divorce Conversations for Women is the title. Okay, excellent. Now I'll close, but I'll only close if you promise to come back sometime and talk about some additional issues. I would love to. (laughs) These conversations have been so fun. Rhonda, thank you so much. I really appreciate your knowledge and expertise. And thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, So thank you again to Rhonda. And we'll see everybody again next time uh, on Divorce Stories uh, with Dennis R. Vitrano, Jr., divorce attorney. Thanks so much. Take care. Bye bye.